This video lecture is over risk assessment, and the material comes from Chapter 2, or Assignment 2, of the CPCU 500 text. In this video lecture, we'll begin with discussing methods of identifying loss exposures. In order to effectively analyze loss exposures, you must have data. There are certain data requirements for exposure analysis to be effective, so we'll also discuss those. Additionally, we'll look at the nature of probability, a key element in analyzing loss exposures, and using probability distributions. This will make up part one of the risk assessment lecture. In part two of the risk assessment lecture, we'll discuss central tendency and several other elements related to risk assessment. But let's begin with identifying loss exposures. Remember that identifying loss exposures is the first step in the risk management process after you have determined your objectives. Broadly speaking, identifying loss exposures can be broken down into document analysis and everything else. Document analysis for an organization should focus on both external and internal documents. Internal documents includes things like insurance policies and financial statements. External documents might come from regulators, or it might come from your insurance agent or accountant. Let's look at some examples. Risk, analysis, risk assessment questionnaires and checklists, which are external documents. Financial statements and underlying accounting records, which are of course internal. Contracts, which could be either. Insurance policies, which are internal. Loss histories, which might actually be done externally through a consultant or internally. Organizational policies and records, again, could be internal or external. And flow charts and organizational charts, which are typically internal. So let's look at risk assessment, questionnaires, and checklists. Questionnaires ask questions of the business owner or risk manager. And often these are open-ended questions, which can lead to a thorough and detailed investigation of the organization, whereas insurance checklists require you to simply check off various items, and they tend to focus on insurable risks. Let's go to a website that contains a PDF of an old risk analysis questionnaire. While this is from 1998, it actually has some really good examples of the types of questions that might be asked. These, as you can see, are yes or no questions, but by answering these questions, they could lead the business owner or risk manager to think about many other loss exposures. So for example, are the premises kept in good repair? You might say no. How might you do a better job maintaining the premises? Another question, are all entrance doors locked and windows and skylights secured when the premises are not in use? If the answer is no, this might lead the risk manager to determine a procedure for ensuring that doors and windows and skylights are locked. Let's go down to security during working hours. Are measures taken to prevent unauthorized entry to the premises during working hours? Are buildings designed to prevent ready access except through normal entrances? So with these questions, if the answer is yes, the risk manager can move on. But if the answer is no, the obvious next question is, how can we create a procedure or process for changing this to a yes answer? Let's go back to our Prezi. Here is an example of an insurance checklist. I won't go to this website here in this video, but if you go to this website, you'll find that the Hartford, which is an insurance company, has developed a process for creating a checklist for the insured. Both the risk analysis questionnaire and insurance checklist might be very useful to you in doing your risk assessment paper for this course. There are also safety checklists. Both checklists and questionnaires may be produced by insurance companies and insurance agents and brokers. The limitation of insurance checklist or even a risk analysis questionnaire that's produced by an insurance organization is that it might focus on insurable risks. Now let's discuss how financial statements and underlying accounting records might be used to identify loss exposures. For example, the statement of cash flows could be useful to determine funds available to paying for retained losses. The income statement helps to identify net income exposures. The balance sheet can help with both property and some liability exposures. 
For example, asset entries on the balance sheet might show property that exists, and obligations such as mortgage payments might indicate potential liability exposures. All three of these statements can help to identify how much source of funds the organization has to pay for losses as they occur. The balance sheet is especially useful for identifying asset exposures and the income statement for business income exposures. But all of these have significant limitations because accounting values or book values are not the same as replacement cost or what it would cost the organization to replace lost property or lost income. Now let's look at contracts. Contract analysis helps to determine who has assumed liability for which exposures, and it can also be used for property exposures. Entering into a contract can increase or reduce an organization's property and liability loss exposures. When an organization purchases property, that obviously increases their asset exposure, but a hold harmless agreement might increase or reduce liability exposures depending on how the hold harmless agreement is written. We'll discuss more about hold harmless agreements in chapter four, which is risk financing. Contract analysis is particularly important for organizations involved in leasing, engaging in construction projects, distribution or outsourcing, such as technology, transportation, and marketing firms. Next, let's look at insurance policies. Insurance policies, of course, are a type of contract, but deserve their own attention because of their uniqueness, especially when it comes to risk management. Remember that since insurance policies are standardized, it's important to make sure the policy fits the exposures. If you go back to the Hartford's website, you'll find some interesting tools for small businesses that help them identify whether they have certain exposures and whether they would be covered under the standard insurance contract. If certain exposures that a business has are not covered, they may need endorsements. It's even possible to endorse a policy to exclude certain exposures the business does not have. This might result in a lower premium. Next, an organization should look at organizational policies and records to help to identify loss exposures. For example, corporate bylaws, employee manuals, procedural manuals, and communication and ethics policies all potentially could help to identify loss exposures. Employee manuals that violate laws could create a liability situation for an organization. Obviously, there are different issues for small businesses when it comes to organizational policies and records. Since smaller organizations, especially those with fewer than five employees, may not have any organizational policies or have a very limited number of them. Having organizational policies and keeping organizational records will tend to result in a risk reduction rather than a risk increase. Last, flow charts and organizational charts. Flow charts depict the sequence of activities performed by a particular organization or process. An organization chart shows the various levels of hierarchy of employees within the organization. Flow charts are especially good for manufacturing processes, transportation, and information flow. Information flow is especially important for most businesses today, even small businesses. A flow chart is especially useful to identify potential bottlenecks, which are disruptions in the production, transformation, or information flow that might have a significant impact on the organization. Think about bottlenecks on the highway or interstate. A bottleneck on the interstate can cause traffic to come to a halt for many, many miles. Similarly, an organizational bottleneck could cause the business flow to come to a halt for many hours or even days. When many people think about risk management, they think looking at an organization's lost history is most useful. But there are many weaknesses in looking at lost histories. For one, not all losses that could occur have occurred before. Many times, losses have resulted in a near miss or minor accident that is never recorded within the organization, but a slip and fall that results in a bruise today could result in a severe injury tomorrow. And for a small business, often businesses don't record smaller accidents or even sometimes larger ones. Now let's look at some identification tools that don't involve document analysis. First, compliance review. 
Compliance review is something that is significant for a larger organization, like compliance with laws like ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, HIPAA, or OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Act. This is often not too realistic for small businesses, since it tends to be very costly and time-consuming. Next, personal inspection. Sometimes loss exposures can only be identified by looking at the workflow and watching it. These kinds of visits often reveal loss exposures that might not appear in the descriptions of an organization's flowchart. However, there are weaknesses with this as well, because if you're watching what people do, they tend to slow down. They tend to be more careful. So sometimes a surprise inspection or an inspector who isn't identified can be more valuable. And last, expertise. Businesses should use expertise within and beyond the organization. Employees of all levels have expertise about the organization's loss exposures that others do not. Even someone who is a cashier or receptionist at an organization might be able to identify loss exposures that a manager cannot. And a frontline manager can identify loss exposures sometimes that can't be identified by a top supervisor. But additionally, an organization should go beyond its own employees using accountants, IT security specialists, lawyers, and insurance agents and brokers to help identify risks. A good insurance agent or broker should be your best source of risk analysis. However, as we've discussed before, if an insurance agent doesn't seem to have the organization's best interest at heart or seems to be overselling in terms of insurance, the organization should find a different insurance agent or broker. Now let's discuss data requirements for exposure analysis. Many of the things that we just discussed involved collecting data to identify loss exposures, and now these loss exposures must be analyzed in order to select an appropriate risk treatment technique. This is especially true when using past losses to predict future outcomes, which frankly is most common in risk management. In order for data to be useful for exposure analysis, it must be relevant, complete, consistent, and organized. Let's start with relevant data. By nature, data becomes irrelevant over time. Things change. Imagine the difference between auto losses in the 1910s and in the 2010s. This is an extreme example, but it's also a good one. Exposures to hurricane and certainly exposures to liability have changed over time. Also, you must factor in inflation and other shifts in value of property and services, even in the short term. For example, health care costs have risen dramatically just in the last 10 years and every year before. Minor changes in personnel data or operations can also make data irrelevant. So for example, you might have significant data on the performance of employees and their loss histories. But if you've overturned some of your staff, that data might be mostly irrelevant. Data must also be complete. You need as much information as possible to isolate the cause of losses and come up with an appropriate treatment method. The more complete your data, the more appropriate your risk treatment decisions. Think about looking at only a balance sheet to come up with the values of your property. First of all, a balance sheet doesn't specify where your property is located. If the business has more than one location, this could be expect and you purchase different insurance policies on each location or have different values at each location, an overall property value is not going to be relevant. Also, the balance sheet, as we mentioned before, has book values or accounting values, and these values have been depreciated and often not inflated. So the current replacement cost or market value wouldn't be reflected in the balance sheet. You have to ask yourself with all data, what's missing and what are the problems with this data? Next, data must be consistent. Data has to be collected on a consistent basis for all recorded losses. So you can't skip a year of data collection because you might miss a specific loss. But it also means that the type of data that's collected is the same, that the questions that are asked when the data is collected are also consistent. We initially had a problem with this on the surveys. An example of this is if you ask how many losses have you had over the last five years? 
Are you asking about a total over five years or how many losses each year? Also, if you ask how many insured losses have you had over five years, there may be deductibles or coinsurance costs within those insured losses. If the response is only reflecting paid insured losses, that might be different than the total amount of losses that were partially insured. Also, data must be expressed in constant dollars. It must reflect changes in the consumer price index in order to be consistent, which is similar to relevant data. And last, data must be organized. Data should be organized and analyzed in a way that makes it useful. Without organized data, you can't identify patterns and trends and other expectations. Organized means sorting the data by various demographic and other risk-related characteristics. For our data set, for example, we organize it by parish, size of the business, industry type, and other factors that relate to risk. If we lumped hurricane-related losses in South Louisiana with those in Central or North Louisiana, that would not give us a good depiction of actual loss exposures. Now let's talk about the nature of probability, which is directly related to loss analysis. Probability, remember, equals relative frequency. In other words, the number of times a loss could occur relative to the number of times it could have occurred. Let's look at theoretical versus empirical probability, and then we'll discuss the law of large numbers. So first, theoretical versus empirical probability. Theoretical probabilities are objective and mathematically unchanging. So for example, the probability that when you roll two dice, you'll come up with a seven is unchanging. It's a mathematical fact. The probability that you'll get heads or tails is a mathematical fact as well. Each time you flip that coin, you have a 50% chance of either getting heads or tails. And some things are simple enough that they can be accurately estimated theoretically. Another way of thinking about theoretical is that you don't have to have seen a coin flip or a roll of dice in order to know the probabilities. You don't have to have experienced it. Some things are simple enough to be estimated theoretically, but most things are not. Empirical probabilities are based on observations and may change as new data becomes available. Empirical probabilities are estimates, and the more information that you have, the better the estimate. So this is the collection of data over time, and the longer time goes on, and the more information surrounding the loss experience that you have, the more accurate your probabilities. Since theoretical probability is accurate, it would be preferable to use theoretical probability. But in most cases, life is not so simple. Therefore, theoretical probabilities cannot be used. Insurance professionals and other risk management professionals must use empirical probabilities. Now let's discuss the law of large numbers. A quote from the text, probability analysis is particularly effective for projecting losses in organizations that have, first, a substantial volume of data on past losses, and second, fairly stable operations. Because of what we discussed in Risk Management 2005, that as the number of observations increases, outcomes become more predictable, you need a substantial volume of data in order to have predictable outcomes. And if your operations are volatile, you're not going to be able to use past experience to predict future experiences. This is why we have to use data from lots of small businesses to make reliable determinations. Remember that data must be relevant. So now let's look at using probability distributions to analyze losses and estimate expected future losses. Probability distributions are developed using probabilities. Let's look at an example. In this example, we'll be calculating the number of employee injuries on a construction site. What we're really looking for is the probability that there will be one injury in one year on the construction site. So what we'll actually do is we'll use historical data to come up with the probabilities of each number of employee injuries over the past many years. So let's say that these are the probabilities that we come up with based on our historical data. The number of injuries per year being 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. 
For our example, there were no years where there were more than five injuries. And based on historical data, the probability for each one of these was 0.426 or 42.6% of the years had zero injuries, 0.35 or 35% of the years had one injury, 0.17 or 17% of the years had two injuries, 0.05 or 5% of the years had three injuries, 0.003 or 0.3% of the years had four injuries, and 0.001 or 0.1% of the years had five injuries, and there were no years with more than five. The total of the probabilities should be one, and this does add up to one, because if you add up all the probabilities, it should account for every single year in our data set. Let's look a little more at features of probability. In order to be properly constructed, outcomes must be both of these two things. Mutually exclusive, in other words, only one outcome is possible each time. Each year, you can only have either 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. But you can't have both 0 and 3 injuries in a given year. And then losses must be collectively exhaustive. This means that these are the only possible outcomes, and they add up to 1, just as we found. Now let's calculate our overall probability of loss. To do so, we multiply the number of injuries per year times the probability, and these are the results. When we add these up, we get the total probability of one loss in one year, which is almost 86%. This is because in some years we had more than one injury, so our number is quite a bit higher than 35%. Since in some years we had more than one injury, our probability for one injury is 0.857, or 85.7%. Now let's look further at probability distributions. A probability distribution can be discrete or continuous. Let's first discuss a discrete probability distribution. With a discrete probability distribution, there are a finite number of outcomes. The possible outcomes are countable, and you cannot have 2.5 outcomes, although you can have a 2.5 probability of occurrence. With a continuous probability distribution, there are an infinite number of possible outcomes. So it looks like a normal bell curve. The curve is continuous. It doesn't end. These kinds of probability distributions are a bit more difficult to work with. The example above is a finite number, but in life, losses tend to be continuous. In insurance and risk management, in order to simplify the analysis of a continuous probability distribution, insurance and risk management professionals commonly divide outcomes into a number of ranges, or bins. This is the end of the risk assessment part one. In the next video, we'll discuss risk assessment further.